Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 2. I've got 10 minutes. Here we go. You listen fast, I'll talk fast. In Matthew chapter 2, we read that after the birth of Jesus, some wise men came from the east to Jerusalem looking for what they heard was this new king of the Jews who had been born. And they had seen his amazing star the night he was born, and, and uh, they had followed it to Jerusalem, and they wanted to come and worship this new king. Well, the chief priests and scribes in Jerusalem told them, well, the, the, the king was supposed to have been born in, in Bethlehem. That's where the scripture prophesied that he would be born, and, and so they, they sort of sent them that way. And Herod, when he heard the purpose of their trip, that they were wanting to worship this new baby king, he feigned interest and said, well, when, when you find him, let me know where he is so that I can come and worship him too. Of course, we know that all Herod wanted to do was to eliminate this threat to his own throne. Well, the wise men agreed and they traveled on and a star led them to the home of Mary and Joseph. Not to the stable in Bethlehem, but to the home of Mary and Joseph in Nazareth. Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced or they were overjoyed. And so these guys responded with gladness. They had traveled hundreds of miles over the course of many months and had finally found what they were looking for. I think it's safe to say they were glad. They were overjoyed. But they also responded with glorifying God. Christ. In verse 11, it tells us, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Now, after all, isn't that what the true essence of worship really is? Not the falling down part, but the, but the worship, okay? They worshiped him. We truly worship God whenever we direct all the attention, all of the honor, all of the glory, all of the praise to him and him alone. No one else. Well, this appears to be a consistent response through many of the people who were associated with the Christmas story and the birth of Christ, all of them surrounding him. In Luke chapter 1, when Mary received the message from the angel that she was going to be the mother of Jesus, she responded with one of the most beautiful and eloquent expressions of praise and worship that was ever composed. In Luke chapter 1, it is called the Magnificat. Then in Luke chapter 2, when the angels heralded the message to the shepherds who were out in the fields watching their flocks, they heralded this, they heralded this great news that Christ was born, and they said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. But their response, these guys, the wise men, their response didn't stop with just being glad and just glorifying Christ, but they also responded by giving gifts to Jesus. The second part of verse 11, when they had opened, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, remember that this event didn't happen at the stable in Bethlehem, this happened probably close to two years after Jesus was born, when the wise men finally showed up. They saw young Jesus, and they worshiped him by giving him gifts. Listen, giving is one of the most natural responses that flows from the heart of anyone who loves another person, giving to that person. Probably most of you already have gifts wrapped and under your tree. Is that right? They're for the people that you love, right? They're for people you love. You want to give to those people. And giving sacrificially comes from the heart of a person who has already had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In fact, I'm actually going to preach about giving next Sunday. Uh, so come back and hear that, okay? But uh, the, the gold, the, the gifts that they, they gave, the gold was befitting of a king. These, these gifts have a spiritual significance to them. These were not just gifts that they grabbed off the shelf as they were checking out at Walmart, okay? But they had given some thought to them. And we can see a spiritual significance. The gold was befitting of a king representing Christ's royalty. The frankincense was used in worship. It speaks of his relationship that he has with every believer. And the myrrh was a spice that was commonly used as a a preservative and a deodorizer when they were preparing a body for burial. And this speaks of Christ's work of redemption when he died on the cross for your sins and mine. Now, I know that we're all different and we express ourselves in different ways, particularly when it comes to a spiritual context. I I understand that, but I think there are some notable parallels between the wise men's responses and how we react when we have had a personal encounter with Christ. Some people are very excitable, and when they get saved, they jump up and down and yell and shout. That's wonderful. That's great. Some just sit and bow quietly. Others may raise their hands in praise and worship to the Lord. Others may just sit and smile or cry. But in each of these instances, there's one commonality, and and there are are a few commonalities. There is, first of all, an inexpressible joy. When somebody gets saved, they just can't hardly contain it. There's an inexpressible joy, and then there's a spontaneous desire to do something to glorify the Lord. When someone comes to Christ, lots of times they want to charge hell with a squirt gun. I mean, they are just ready to do something for the Lord, right? You want to glorify God with your life. And there's also an unmistakable generosity that characterizes the person who has bowed in the presence of the Lord. I wonder if those same things are evident in your life and in mine. Well, what happened to these wise men after they saw Jesus? When, when they had seen him and worshipped him and had given their gifts, look in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 2, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. They didn't leave the same way they came. And no one ever does who has met Jesus Christ. Somehow, God gave them clear instructions that they were not supposed to go back by the same route that they had followed, but instead go by a different route. Now, I understand that this is talking about the, the, the route or the geographical pathway that they traveled But I'm also convinced that these were changed men as well. They were not the same men they had been before they met Jesus, even as an infant or a young child. Jesus made it clear in Matthew chapter 7 that those who follow him travel a different road than they did before their conversion. We once walked on the broad road that leads to destruction, but now, since we have had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're on the narrow road that leads to eternal life in heaven. These guys returned another way, by another route. And so it is when we begin to follow Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful statement? The one who follows Jesus doesn't continue walking down the same old path that they used to walk. They don't go the same way. They don't live the same way they lived before they began to follow Christ. Listen, don't let this Christmas season pass you by 
without allowing yourself to be changed by Christ. Be like the wise men and go home a different way. Go home a different person. Be changed by him. Don't be the same. Now, you may have heard the Christmas story dozens of times in your life, but if it never reaches your heart, it is all in vain. You see, Jesus came to this earth for you. Jesus died to save you. Jesus came to give you life. Rejoice in that. Don't miss this most important part of the story. Luis Palau tells a story that I think illustrates well what I'm talking about. A wealthy European family was going to have a dedication of their newborn baby. They were going to dedicate their newborn baby to the Lord. And they were going to have the dedication not at their church but in their enormous mansion at at their home. Dozens of guests were invited to this elaborate affair, and people came absolutely dressed to the nines. I mean, they looked sharp. And after depositing their elegant wraps and coats on a bed, the guests were entertained royally. But soon it came time for the purpose of their gathering, the baby's dedication ceremony. But where was the baby? No one could find the baby. No one knew. The child's nanny ran upstairs looking uh, for him, went to his room looking for him, and the baby was not there. She came back with a a panicked look on her face. And so everybody uh, starts scouring this enormous home looking for the baby. They were desperate to find it. And then someone recalled having seen the baby asleep on one of the beds. And sure enough, the baby was on the bed, all right, piled underneath all the coats and wraps and furs. The very object of the day's celebration had been forgotten and neglected and nearly smothered. No one had heard the baby's cry. I hope that's not the case today. What a tragedy it would be. What a terrible tragedy it would be if we gather and pray and sing praises and hear sermons and wonderful songs and not hear the voice of the Christ child. I believe Jesus is here. And I believe he desires to be worshipped by each of us. I, I hope you have sensed that you have been in his presence already today in this service. He wants our lives to bring glory to him. Are you glorifying Christ with your life? Let's determine to use our lives to bring glory to Jesus, all right? Season your glorying. Let's pray together.